Amen. You know that song that Tommy just introduced to us? It's the answer to the question that we're going to be looking at for the next couple of weeks. We're in a time of year where we look forward. There's going to be a celebration here in a couple of weeks. A celebration that, for the most part, the world doesn't understand. And the world may ask the question, what's the big idea about it? Well, the big idea is what we just sung about, Jesus Christ. About praising his name, not because he's just another guy or, or did some, some nice things. The big idea is that Jesus came just like he said he would. Jesus died just like he said he would. Jesus was put in a grave just like he said he would. And he rose again just like he said he would. That's the big idea. The big idea is the resurrection changed everything for mankind. That night, that last night, that Jesus, before his crucifixion, before he was arrested, before he endured the the beatings and the false accusations, Jesus fully knowing what was to come ahead of him had his followers on his mind. It was in that that last night meeting with his, his followers, don't worry, he said. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus told him that he was going away. Jesus had told him that, that the crucifixion was needed. But that wasn't the end. He had told them that he would rise again. He had told them that he would come back. He said in that moment that, that he was going to prepare a place for them. But he would come back again because where he was, there he wanted them to be also. Jesus even told them in, 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 our, in our text this morning, He instructed them, if you love me, just do what I say. Follow my commandments. I'm praying for you. I pray to the Father that he will give you another comforter, another paraclete, uh, uh, another encourager. I am going, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm coming again until I come again. There's going to be someone here to help you along the way. He said, I am in my Father. You and me, I and you. But in the middle of all that, in verse 19, I want us to look at. Jesus says these words. Yet a little while. Just, just in a little bit. The world will see me no more, but, but you see me because I live. Now, Jesus had already instructed them that live, he's got to go. He, the, even though they may not have, uh, have understood what the crucifixion was, the, the end result, they knew what crucifixion was. But as we see in Scripture, his disciples, they didn't understand all of it. Or maybe it was selective hearing. I mean, we, uh, don't we deal with selective hearing? We want to listen to just what we want to hear. Whether it's in church, whether it's with our spouses, 
I mean, we, 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 we say that our, our, our kids really have selective hearing. They hear it just what they want to hear. But the disciples hear the same thing Jesus tells them. He promises. And that's what I want us to look at this morning. As we unpack what the big idea is all about when it comes to the, the resurrection, I want us to look at this, this, uh, this thought this morning it's that is this, the promise of the resurrection. Jesus said, I'm going. He's already told them what's going to take place. But then he uses these words, I live. But not just I, but ye shall live also. Folks, there's a promise right there. You know, and promises are, are funny things. They're easy to make and, and often a lot easier to break. But generally, they're, they're hard to keep. The poet Robert Frost captured this truth in his poem, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. And in, the, in this particular poem, he writes about how sometimes we, we wish we would be free for just a, a little bit at least of all of really life's obligations that we're required to meet. And, and that, that type of, of, uh, of freedom in this poem, the, the traveler stops on his journey beside a, a quiet wood one wintry evening. And for, for just a moment, he's able to enjoy the quietness and, and the solitude. And, and it's in that moment he's watching the, the snowflakes fall and, and the blanket of snow that, that falls on the ground. And the poem, Frost writes, the woods are lovely, dark and deep but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. You know, sometimes our, our word feels like we're having to go miles and miles before we get that sleep. And, and when we think of sleep, it's rest, isn't it? And sometimes keeping those promises that we make are hard and difficult. And that's why so many break them. It was Maccabee, Maca, let me rework on this again. Machiavelli, there we go, the Italian diplomat during the Renaissance, said this, the promise given was a necessity of the past. The word broken is a necessity of the present. That seems like a lot of what people are saying today. Keeping our word was, was something of the past, but in the present, to live and, and to thrive and, and to do, our promises must be broken. You know, regardless of the reason why promises break, it's sadly, they're broken frequently. And they're broken so much, and it happens to all of us, and maybe we've done it a, a, a few times. And we know firsthand how hard it is to keep those promises And because of that, it's difficult to take the word of someone else. We've been there. We've done that. We think about what's happened in the past more than what could happen in the future. But what's so amazing about Christ, though, that is so different is that every promise that he made 
he kept. Every promise that he has made, he keeps on keeping. And he says, I'm going to live. Disciple, you just said you're going to die. You're preparing us for this end, and and you say that you're going to live, and at the same time, we can live also? And Jesus was saying, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Even though you may not understand it, that's exactly because I live, you will, can live also. Not just because of what I do, but the decision that you make. Just because there's broken promises in this world. That should not keep us from believing the promises of God. Because here's the thing, God always, listen folks, God always works. God always keeps his promises. God always acts. We see in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13, according to what? His promises. Everything that God does is based on the promises that he has made. We see in Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19, God is not a man that he should lie. God says in, in first, or pardon me, God, God says in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5, I won't fail you nor forsake you, Joshua. And God, folks, God does exactly what he says. He says, I'm going to be with you. He said, I will provide a way. I will provide it such a way that that will make this relationship between me and you sinners right. Because there's not a thing you can do about it. But God being God can, can't he? And that's exactly what he did. Sending Jesus Christ. And we must understand this, that God never fails in his promises. And so when Jesus says, I'm going to live, you're going to live, you can live also. We know it's appointed unto man once to die, then what? The judgment. But Jesus promises because of his resurrection, that death can be conquered in our lives. You know, when we think of this resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's the most provable fact in all of history. There's more evidence that Christ arose from the grave than any other fact. Folks, there are those today, followers of Islam, that will go and visit a tomb, and guess what? Muhammad is still there. Or what's left of him. Those of Buddha, Buddhism, will, can go to their temples to, to find Buddha, and guess what? Buddha will still be there. But you can go to past presidents and historical figures, and guess what? And, and graves of loved ones, and they're still there. But you go where Jesus was buried. You know what you'll find? An empty tomb. Because Jesus rose just like he said he would. And because he was resurrected, folks, we can live a resurrected life also. We have that promise in his word. He promised it. He fulfilled it. And the question to ask this morning is this. What does the the promise of of this resurrection mean for me? What does this mean for us? And when we look at Scripture, we look at this account. We can ask it this way. What does the promise of the resurrection mean for the church? Because who was here with Jesus on that last night? It was his church that he had called out. 
It was that body of believers. And what does the promise of the resurrection mean for the church? Well, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 14, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Skipping to verse 17, And if Christ not be raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of men most miserable for the church folks listen the the resurrection is the key of our doctrine you take the resurrection listen there is no faith without the resurrection all the claims of jesus rest on the fact that that he was resurrected from the dead jesus promised it and it happened according to scripture you take the resurrection out, Jesus could be just like any other crazy man that says, I'm going to die for a bunch of people just to prove who I am. But the resurrection proves everything. And for the church, when Jesus was crucified, as we look, we look in this account through the Gospels, For the most part, the church wasn't around to see if they had scattered. They scattered even though they had seen Jesus work. They they saw, they experienced Jesus saying the words and the dead rising. They had seen water turn to wine. They had seen the blind see and the lame able to walk they had heard him speak they had seen the fish and and the bread multiplied they had experienced all of that but on this moment where were they out of fear they had take they had took off well someone said well well peter well you know what peter is just like most or a lot of uh, church people we want to get close enough just to see isn't that what peter did peter followed but he was just close enough just to be able to see he didn't want to go all in because you know what someone may say "That, that guy's crazy you know peter worried about what's going to happen to him and and we know that he denied and but you know, just close enough that he could see what's happening. Many in church want to get just close enough to see what's happening and make them feel good that, you know, hey, I was in the presence, but not really going all in. But the church, the church was rocked. They scattered. They had experienced all these things. Gee, they'd even heard, like I said, Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 26. He had told them this. Then says Jesus and them, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered, said him, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto you that this night before the cock crow, or the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter said unto him, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples, boy, we, we put it on, on, on Peter's shoulders, but all of them said that. Jesus told us, I'm going to die. He said, you guys are going to be scattered. And the resurrection of Christ had to be unmistakable, not only to to convince a a hostile world, but to confirm the faith and restore the confidence of of this bewildered flock, this this broken church, this, this group of people looking for answers. 
And so you ask the question, what the, the, pro, the promise of the, the resurrection have to do with the church? It puts the church on solid ground. It gives them the reason to the why we are to go. Jesus is alive. If the resurrection is not true, many have died for nothing. But folks, because it is true, we preach not a, a defeated Jesus hanging on a cross, but a victorious Savior who rose from the grave. And so the promise of the resurrection means everything to the church. It gives us the confidence and the foundation to go. But when we look at this account, there's other that are involved and we see what the the resurrection means in their lives not only a church but what about someone like mary magdalene who is a lot like us how many of us are sinners there this is where everybody's hands must go up maybe even two hands and both feet mary magdalene was a sinner not only we, we get this characteristic about, we're told about Mary Magdalene, and she was one that was what? Had seven devils cast out of her before she met Jesus, or when she met Jesus. And there's the, this friendship with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. But it, isn't it interesting? Seven cast out. Seven we know in Scripture means what? completion she was as worse as you could possibly get and jesus touched her oh we look at seven and we think of the end times but when we see seven here she is as worse she is the de depraved and as de decrepit as as a person could get and it didn't stop jesus christ to meeting her and supplying the needs that she needed. She was the lowest depths of humanity. Not only that, she was from Magdala. Not only the seven spirits, but Magdala is synonymous with every evil sin that you could, could even imagine. And history states that it was because of wickedness that destroyed Magdala. Yeah, here was Mary, a sinner. No hope whatsoever. I mean, it controlled her. And folks, that's what sin does. Sin controls. Yet Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You see Jesus saying all that labor? It's not a select few. Even the one that we would consider the worst of all sinners. Are you under that labor of sin? Come to me. Let, let me take that labor off. Let me put my yoke upon you. I'm the one that can give you rest. And that's why Mary loved Jesus so much. There is not a sin too far that the resurrection cannot reach. Mary loved Christ because he first loved her. He looked past the sin, saw the sin that needed to be forgiven. He forgave it, and, and, and Mary gave her a new life. And just as she went all the way into her sin, she went all the way to her Savior. And what's so amazing about Mary is this. 
that some may consider her the, the last that you would think that Jesus would reach. But when it came to the resurrection, she was the first to see him. Isn't it amazing the life that Jesus gives? She, she experienced it. He raised her brother. She saw the stone that was taken away. She had gone to help with the spices. She ran to, to Peter's feet, and they had taken the Lord out of the sepulcher. And, and we don't know where they had taken him. Can you imagine at that moment a faith that is rocked? Yes, she follows Peter back to the, stone, to the tomb. And Mary, it was Mary that stood at the tomb weeping, weeping over the agony that Christ had faced. She, she wept for the cruel end of, of this, this life that was taken away. She wept for her own hopelessness of what is to happen now. There was no one to go to, nowhere to turn. He was the one, as Peter said, that had the words of eternal life. He was the one that could bind up the brokenhearted. And in that moment, in her turning in her mourning, it turned to gladness through those tear blared eyes. She saw her Savior. She knew it was Him when her heart was filled. And the words that the resurrected Savior said to this sinner that had been saved by the grace of God. Go and tell. For the church, we have a foundation to stand on, a reason to live. But just like Mary, the sinner, the promise of the, of the resurrection gives us a command to go and tell because you know what? We are no different than Mary, the sinner. But there's another character in this account that we see. And we see ourselves in it. And it's this, it's Thomas the doubter. See, Thomas didn't doubt any more than anyone else. <laughs> Thomas was just outspoken about it. All the disciples doubted. They took off. If they really believed what Jesus said, they would have been there. they took off out of fear they doubted they were wondering what's going to happen next thomas was just outspoken he was opposite of mary that he was calculating he didn't really jump to conclusions it's not that he didn't lack courage he was the one that said to jesus let us go with you also that we may die also and so when we think of Thomas, we must look at the outspokenness that stands there. But here's the thing about the resurrection in, in Jesus, that he understands the difficulty it is for faith. He knew that his soul was shaken. He knew that the words that Thomas had spoken, unless I see him, I will not believe. He knew that Thomas had spoken those words and, and he was not really in his right mind. Yet in that moment, Jesus had compassion on him. And after eight days, he appeared. And in John 20, we see, we read these words. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold thy hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. It was the resurrection that changed, transformed Thomas's life. He had experienced at that moment the resurrected Lord. And from there, it allowed him to go and proclaim the resurrected Lord. So 
But what does the promise of the resurrection do for those that doubt? It builds our faith so that we can go. It empowers us to go. The resurrection changed Thomas. It doesn't mean, folks, that difficulties won't come. It doesn't mean that our faith won't get rocked. But even in the moments we find ourselves doubting, listen, folks, there's still a Savior we can trust. And a Savior that enlists us to serve. He told Mary, a sinner, to go and tell. He told a doubter, I- I'm the Savior, see. Look at my, look at the proof. And you know what we know about Thomas is the history tells us that Thomas went in the area of Parthia, northeastern Iran. As a missionary, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ that there is a Savior that was resurrected from the dead. Here was a man that that doubted. His faith wrought. But when he grabbed hold of the promise of the the resurrection, it it erased his doubt. It gave him his message. And history tells us that as he's proclaiming the message of Christ, the resurrected Christ, he dies by a spear. The one who doubted, when he was able to grasp what the resurrection was and realize that the promise of the resurrection was fulfilled, it did a dynamic thing in his life. And he went the rest of his life proclaiming Jesus. Has the resurrection changed your life? Or do you sit there and doubt? Has the resurrection given you the message that you need to go and proclaim? So I think we we see ourselves like Mary, and we see ourselves like Thomas. But I think we see a lot of ourselves like Peter the denier. Because he around the crucifixion and, 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 and the resurrection, it was, it was Peter, this brash person, this, this one who, who made mistakes, this person who, who talked too much, who failed at, at critical times. Hmm. Let's take Peter out and insert our own name. See, as Peter... Even though he saw Jesus do all these things, even though he was, he was in the inner circle, it was Peter who, who sunk in water because he took his eyes off Jesus. Oh, we forget the part that he was the one crazy enough to get out of the boat. But he took his eyes off and started to sink. It was Peter who said, you will not wash my feet, Jesus. It was Peter that said, we will follow you all the way. We will not allow you to die. It was Peter that in meeting Jesus, Jesus says, you are Simon. I'm going to call you Cephas, a stone. It was Peter who made great confessions. In one aspect, was even more direct than Thomas. And it was Peter that said this, Lord, I will never deny you. But after that cock crowed, he had done it three times. 
You see, after this, the crucifixion, Peter was a man with a troubled heart. You know, many times we are people with a troubled heart. We feel like we have failed the Lord. We may even wonder, can, can, can Christ even use me? We may even get to a point, can Christ still use me? Because we may be at a point, you may be at a point, feel like, you know what, I'm all washed up. Let me tell you, if you are here breathing this morning, Christ has a plan for you. Christ has a purpose for each and every one of us. And guess what? It involves proclaiming the message that Jesus Christ is alive. Peter wasn't washed up. Even though he was a man of troubled hearts, all four Gospels show the story of his denying. His faith had been crushed. But isn't it amazing, Mary, the first one to see, to go to the tomb, what did the angels say? Go and tell Peter. Aren't you glad God doesn't just throw us out? Aren't you glad when we fail, God doesn't say, oh, no more chances with them. I can't use them. They're worthless. But Mary, go and tell. Tell what? Jesus is alive. Go tell what? That Jesus kept his promise. That if he lives, we can live also Here's Peter, even after encountering Jesus, I'm going fishing. It was with Peter that Jesus said, do you love me three times? And, Je and Peter said, yes, I do. Feed my sheep. We see that Peter is troubled. But we also hear these words in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23 uh, from Peter. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. That was Peter that spoke those words, who was filled by the Holy Ghost. Jesus promised, I'm going. I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send you an encourager. And oh, what an encourager that is that embolden us with the words of Jesus. That you crucified him, but it was God that raised him from the dead. It was Peter that in Acts chapter 5 and verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. We are his witnesses. <laughs> what happened to the denier? My friends, the resurrection changes everything. He went from a denier to a proclaimer. Folks, we have a decision here to make this morning. You do. What does the promise of the resurrection mean to you? Folks, the resurrection takes away all excuses. Oh, I'm just a sinner. Well, that's why Jesus died, and that's why he was resurrected, to take care of that. Well, I doubt. Well, the resurrection takes care of that. Well, I've denied Christ. Guess what? The resurrection takes care of that. Well, what's the foundation I can stand on? That is the foundation. Jesus said it, and he accomplished it. 
so that he can give you and I life. You know, it's interesting. The cicada locusts have a 17-year life cycle. Do you realize that the locust, the cicada locust, stays in there, its cocoon, its larvae, on the ground for 17 years? I mean, think about how that, when I think about that, that's how old Sarah Beth is. So they went in this larvae when she was born and 17 years later, when the time is right, it sounds like chainsaws taken off. They awake, they're everywhere, they're eating everything, and they only stay for a few weeks. They mate, they lay eggs in the soil, and guess what? They die. In a few weeks, you would never guess that they had been there for, except for two things. There are holes in our trees and empty shells of bugs, empty bugs all around. Waiting for a coming day, they don't know anything. They're dead in the ground. Only the potential for life is locked and encoded somewhere in, in that genetic combination of DNA that they, they didn't even know that they have. But when that moment comes, that moment that God chose before the foundation of earth, that, that genetic pattern kicks in, those bugs do what the Creator intended them to do. They just follow the Creator's direction, not trying to figure it out. But they're part of the code that the, the Creator has placed in them, shedding that out of their shell, flying away, empty bugs. And I wonder this morning, are you an empty bug or just a shell? Have you that genetic code of a child of God? that God places in those that are his. Because there's a coming a day when, when you leave this early world shell behind to fly to Jesus. See, the DNA of a human being includes the need to be connected with our creator. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the long sleep in the ground of sin is ended. Man is free to leave that shell of sin. The cross waiting for anyone who would be free. Listening to the call from deep within the Father, God calls each and every one to come to him. You know what's amazing about the resurrected Lord? He doesn't turn anyone away. He's waiting to respond in love. His cross, his offer of eternal life, of fellowship, of forgiveness. If we're willing. The promise of the crucifixion, or the resurrection, gives us hope. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. The world, folks, will promise you whatever, is, whatever flavor of the day it is. All happiness, all contentment, never fulfilling those promises. But Jesus said, I live so that you can live. God said, I love you this much that I gave my only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him will not perish.
but have everlasting life. The promise of the resurrection. Answers what's the big idea. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you. We thank you, Lord, for this time to be reminded of your goodness and your greatness and your grace. The resurrection of our Lord gives us a foundation to stand on. It gives hope to us as sinners. It helps erase the doubt in our lives. The resurrection takes us from being a denier to placing us in a place to demonstrate who you are. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is a name above all names. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, most of all, we thank you for that, for that grave is empty because he is risen. The victory we have over sin and death. Lord, I pray this morning if there's one here that's never put their faith and trust in Jesus, Lord, that you would continue to speak and call them to you. Lord, I pray that they'd place their faith in him. Lord, we ask that you forgive us of our sins so our prayers not be hindered. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to please stand.